Sure. This is the GNU C library BOF. The BOF agenda was posted to the list uh, three or four weeks ago just to make sure that everybody could see it. It's on the wiki. Uh, we don't have to go through the agenda that's on the wiki. We can talk about anything that the community members in this room uh, want to talk about. Uh, DJ and I actually went through the list and we sorted it so that it was like easy status updates at the beginning to talk about you know community pieces that had status that, that would be interesting to discuss live. And then uh, it was sorted so that the issues with a lot of contention were, were at the, the very end of the, of the list. So um, I'll go through those and we can, we can kind of talk about them. Um, in the vein of talking about process issues, uh, the first question is kind of billbot status, awareness, fixing issues, and things like that. So our waterfall build bot setup is solid red. So we, I mean, like, we kind of, as a community, we committed, we're going to say, okay, let's get these build bots up and running. Let's make sure that the build bots represent the status of post commits so that we can see how things are going across distros. And we have, like, we, I have also not done a good job of monitoring the build bots, making sure that they build, um, and we should. I mean, um, Joseph and I have kind of had a side conversation about the value of the build bots. Um, so you, you could say, you know, well, well, Carlos, what's the value of the build bot? Why do I want to see it? Well, because there are distro variances. And I think, um, you know, we did see the IDNA issues pop up between distros. And so it was, it's nice to see those issues because then you can go back and you can figure out, well, if glibc now for internationalized domain names requires libidn2, then that's something that you, you want to make sure works consistently in the other distros. And the distros are aware of those issues so we can list them in the packaging information when we make a release and it goes out the door. So um, I guess what do we want to do about the build bots? My suggestion had simply been that we sign up people to be responsible for the individual build bots that are their architecture's, you know, primary build bot. Um, and so I'm thinking Tulio keeps saying, you keep saying, you're like, you're like Carlos is going to ask me next. Don't ask me. Don't ask me. I have a green laser pointer. And I can shine it in your eye and be like, enable the build bots for power. Enable the build bots for power. Um, so I think here, this last kind of bullet point, who is responsible for fixing a regression if something comes up? Uh, and who is really responsible for the build bot? So if, does anybody have any ideas? H how do we want to do this as a community? Do we, do we perceive value in the build bots? We, we all have to feel that there's value in the build bot, and there's value in looking at them, that there's value in that. If we don't, then we're not going to do it. it. And then it's not going to be something that we, that we commit to. So Florian, go ahead. You got the floor. Yeah. So. Uh... I must say, for me personally, there's no value in the build bots. I try to look at the output like four years ago or something like that, and sometime more reasonably, I took a brief look again and I just couldn't make sense of the output there because the phases weren't unclear. It wasn't clear what the failure means, and for me, it's usually easier to check out the system of out of our lab automation and just test there. I, that's just my, my personal opinion. I'm, I don't know if anyone else actually uses so the I, bots successfully. Okay. Perfect. I will let, I I'm gonna let Tulio and then we'll pass the mic to Sudesh after Tulio. Go for it. Uh, I have a question for you, Florian, actually. So uh, when you said this, are you actually meaning that the current status of build bot is not usable for you? Or a CI, a continuous integration system, is not useful in general? For me, the, the current output, I just can't interpret okay. it. So uh, I, I, I just I don't understand it. I would, have, uh, I would need some sort of training in order to make sense of it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I want to reflect for a second here that the GDB build bot output is spectacular. It is so beautiful. And you can drill down all the way to standard out for a test and see why the thing failed. And it may be a side effect of the fact that we didn't have full access to be able to deploy a new BuildBot version, or that we're behind on the version of BuildBot we're using, or that, we've, that we need some better integration. But I think, if anything, we, like copying GDB should be our primary like, modus operandi right now. So go ahead, Sidesh. So uh, 
I'm, I'm probably going to step away a little bit from Billbot and talk about our tools usage in general. It's, sure. It's going to yeah. address No, it, this is, this, it doesn't matter. Go ahead, right? please. Uh, so the way we have been doing tools uh, for, our, uh, for our workflow is that we've, we've been putting these independent things out there like Billbot and Patchwork, and then we expect humans, as in us, to uh, look at all of those three or four different things and try to make sense of things. And that, as has been evident over the past five, six, seven years, is it's not worked. So we probably need something that does all of this collation for us and, and, and gives us this one uniform view, which is essentially something like GitLab or Fabricator or something like that. And then have uh, Buildbot, Jenkins, whatever it is, plug into that so that the, the failures are actually in our face and are bothering us every now and then. And it's not somewhere in a silo in the corner uh, going red, green, purple, whatever it is. Uh, we, we, we need to make it a little more uh, integrated than, than it is currently now. So it's, it's less about BuildBot itself and more about how we're going to integrate it into a single tool so that we can uh, actually use sure. it. Sure, yeah. No, I, I, so I, I think that we should say, we, if, the, if the bots were reliable, if the normal state were, they were clean and they reliably detected the regression, then we should have the email people and say, we think your patch broke something. Absolutely. Because the GDB bot does that. And then there is something in your face. It is proactively alerting you there seems to be something wrong with your commit. Right, because, so the, the, the good thing that the GDB folks are doing is that there are people actively looking at that and, and they've, they've taken up the responsibility of doing that and reporting back, right? Yeah. And then you have the build bot sending out emails for failures and so on. Uh, either we do that or we set up something automated. One of the problems we've had with Gilipsy has been uh, resource allocation, right? We, we've, every one of us is doing more than what we can possibly do. So actually adding more responsibilities there would, would probably just result in us meeting next year once again, saying that, hey, but what is red again? Yeah. What do we do about it? Instead, let's just put a tool at it and, and uh, get rid of all of these responses, uh, responsibilities from our plate so that a tool does that for us. And we focus on the technical issues and we don't have to talk about these things again. The, I, I agree, I think so. The concept from my point is that we want, a t like I want to review 100 patches a day. That's my goal. Like my high level vision is like, if how can I review 100 patches a day? It sounds ridiculous, but that's what I want to do. So how, how would you help me review 100 patches a day? And the only way would be if some kind of system, like the way I would do it is I need pre-commit CI and I need post-commit build bots. The post-commit build bots can do a ton of systems. The pre-commit CI can help me filter which things are ready for me to review, right? And so from my goal, I look at how can I make my life as a reviewer easier? And if my goal is to review 100 patches a day, then all of a sudden the questions you ask become very different, right? Because it's that level of scale. I want to review 100 patches a day. I want Joseph to review 100 patches a day. He could probably do it without automation. <laughs> I, want, I want Florian to review 100 patches a day. I want DJ to review 100 patches a day. I want, I want new contributors like Sasha to review 100 patches a day. So how do we get there? And I, I, I do think that there, it's not one one, ans one system fits all, but it definitely an integrated system will make it much easier to do that. So, and it's, I think it will have to be some combination. And I know um, there, there, we've had some discussions that it's not just one or the other. There will be some combination. We do need build bots because the build bots give us a lot of coverage across architectures and distributions. And pre-commit CI provides also some, some kind of agnostic neutral review of of these pro of the processes so that as a maintainer I don't have to do those things. At the so. same time, the bots are running on hardware that does need people maintaining it. They need right. to do things like sort it out when the disk fills up and update the operating system because the reason why some bots went down in the past is the operating system was too old for building glibsy. So you can't really avoid having people responsible for the hardware and operating system on which you're running the bots. So. Some more things can be automated, like telling people you, you have broken the build. 
that you do need people who are responsible for the systems that run the bots and deal with things like the operating system and disk full and so forth. Um, so, yeah, go ahead, Arjun. Oh, just a quick comment. I, I haven't actually submitted anything in a year, but it would be nice if the build bot or, or anything else that is an automated uh, assistant actually participates on the list. Like somebody submits a patch, mm -hmm. and there's a response, hey, your patch applies. It, uh, it meets all the coding standards, let's say, and uh, passes regression tests on Intel or, I don't know, a couple architectures. And yeah. that's already like something, but it's on list. So, so the others can see it, and it kind of helps the conversation keep going. Could even do things like if a patch uh, wasn't reviewed for a month, but still applies, it says, hey, this, this patch is still waiting for review. Or yeah. if a patch stops applying, it just replies to the person who sent it, like rebase and send a version, new version, stuff like this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So okay, sorry. Uh, I'm going to back up a second in because I, I am monitoring time to make sure that we move through these items we should, we should quickly. The Correct. And do the infrastructure one to the end. Uh, well, we split them up by status, and we hope that this one wouldn't be. So I, I want to stop talking about this for a second and just say status only. The status today is the build bots are down, they're red. The next steps that I want to take is sign up people to be responsible for individual build bots. So we make a page and we put down people's names beside every build bot, and then you become the primary point of contact. If that build bot fails, I am going to come to you to find out what the status of that build bot is. And that's my responsibility. I'm a steward for the project, right? And so one of the responsibilities as a steward is I need to find out what's the status of the project, how's, what's the health of the project, how's it going, and then move those issues forward. So when we're done here, does anyone object to us following this kind of process? What I wanted here is there are several people here like some of us are going to be a primary owners for these these build bots is that okay is this a like from a status perspective can we do that and then then keep the build bots green and more importantly i think there's somewhat consensus for we've got to get the fails clean right So when you talk about build bot failures, do you mean uh, infrastructure failures or uh, something that's actually a uh, a uh, something that can be blamed on the glibc build itself? I mean, disk full errors, or is there a difference if, if for the you? build bot status goes red, I will seek the primary person responsible for that build bot to distinguish the difference and determine what the next action is. Or if we okay. could do it in an automated fashion, so, we would. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in CI systems, you usually have uh, that uh, these two error categories. Nobody can agree on what they are named, but the one is the infrastructure failure. The primary and owner, when mm. that machine goes red, is the person whom I will contact to do the determination. Uh, okay. Thanks. Right. I should perhaps also note, while my build many ellipses.py bots are generally green, there is the issue, can we have some way to publish logs for that or whatever, given the issue that it's like several gigabytes of logs a day. So if we had somewhere where we could host presumably only the past few months logs of several gigabytes of logs a day, then there would be option of build many ellipses.py bots exporting their logs somewhere where people could look at them. Um, there was a, yeah, there is a discussion about that, but I think let's move on past status. And, but like Tulio, last question on status, and then we'll move to the next slide, and then we'll, unless, we can come back to this. We can come back to it. I forgot. It. I do, oh, you I, don't want to be responsible for all the power bots? So. Uh, no, no problem for okay. me. Oh, and I think we have to be careful with two things. The first one is that um, we have three architectures there. Yeah. And there is one that is the most used that is not available. Uh, we don't have a, a tester for this x86 I have to put one together. Yeah. I will put my name uh, on it. We will set up an x86 64 uh, tester for Fedora and we will go. Or maybe I'll make DJ do it. The other thing I think <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I think we need to be careful is that um, we have to be more flexible. So uh, the proposal to have someone that is responsible to fix that issue. Uh, maybe we don't even need that. I I'm not against it. I'm just saying that uh, if we look at what GDB is doing, GDB has a mechanism to uh, detect a new failure 
and okay, this is a new failure, it saves that, and it's not going to complain anymore. And this is very important because it detects a failure, it's going to announce the failure exists, and okay, let's go. Uh, this is important because sometimes you need uh, more time to fix that, that thing. And uh, what I've been seeing with another uh, build bot instance uh, I maintain is that if you don't fi fix this fast or if it keeps red, which is what we, ha we have right now in the mm -hmm. community, other issues will appear and we will not and notice. Miss them. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to be flexible in a way with this, in, in so my opinion. I'm okay setting the baseline for the build bot ref to, like, to new at some point and then saying, then being able to go back and find whether or not there's a delta. As a, like, as a high level reviewer of the status, I would still want to go back in and see from this baseline forward how have, we, how have we been doing because we do need to go back and fix those issues, right? If you make them green right away, you, you might not, you don't get pressure to fix the previous issue, but you also will miss the future issues, right? So there's a balance point there, like when do you flip it back to green? Yeah. So um, I acknowledge there's, there's definitely could be an issue there. Okay. Um, this was a status update, um, LTrace, LA trace, and audit status. There are a lot of users that want library trace. They want to be able to trace libraries through, and many of the things that come up here are issues with um, by now, FNO PLT uh, optimizations in the static linker that result in us being unable to do library trace for library calls. Traditionally, it's been done with the GOT and the PLT entries, but we lose some of this information, particularly with uh, by now and FNO PLT. Um, what I want to address is that um, VGA and I have been working on uh, making LTrace live again in an upstream for a place for us to put patches for library trace as a community to put it it lives on GitLab there's an official a GitLab repo and it should be pointed to by uh, the LTrace.org webpage which we got updated to point to the new upstream and we now are able to send patches to an upstream that both Debian and Fedora can merge changes to the problem is that there are a bunch of changes that were needed here, including, DJ, you did the CET changes, right, for, the, for, for LTrace. So it would be great if we could kill LA Trace, but merge some of the features into L LTrace and get support from glibc via LD Audit to implement everything so that whenever we have architectural changes that require PLT adjustments, that the dynamic loader is the only thing that has to know how the PLT changed and that the LD Audit framework allows uh, higher level tools to basically just use the auditing framework to uh, do all this kind of analysis. The downside is if we accept that 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 we a if we accept we want users to use to have trace in production, which I think we do. From my perspective, with my red hat on, we have a lot of customers that want in production library trace. Um, is that uh, we need to fix these bind now versus PLT issues in some way. Right? The trace tooling shouldn't be impacted by the compile decisions that the customers are making with their binaries. We should somehow still be able to affect trace in production. Right? And so this is a production tooling issue. Does anybody, I mean this is just a status update to say kind of the direction we're going. Has anybody been working on this? Does anybody, is anybody interested? Is anybody, so besides you, no I know HJ's in the room. Um, HJ, we talked briefly about this like a year and a half ago, which is the, that when you enable audit and you've got bind now, you keep the PLT entries around and you just redirect the got relocks into the PLT so that you can use them in the event that the audit framework is enabled. But at the same time, you preserve all the performance benefits of bind now or you know not using a PLT. Basically, you just always generate the PLT. If you are fully bound, you never use it, but if the audit framework's there, you, you route to the PLT and you can use it for, for auditing. I believe I had a patch to, you did. Even, even to support FNO PLT in some way, basically is, it's been a while, maybe a year. I create some kind of a backup PLT. And then 
when there is LD audit, I think that the maker should update the uh, guard entry to point to the uh, backup PLT. And uh, however, and uh, there uh, are a year, I don't even anybody remembers, a year ago I submitted a patch of course that will require linker change as well to create a backup PLT as well as the time linker has to recognize there is a backup PLT for profiling or audit purpose. And uh, the, uh, I do not remember what was the conclusion of my proposal. I think the conclusion was that we were busy fixing all the packages for <laughs> CET changes, so we just didn't have time to review your changes. So, uh, I mean, I think, it's the, I think it's the right way to go forward. Like, if I could ask you to, like, let's ping your patches. I, I will, like, CC me to me, and I will again review them, because I, I think we can move this forward, and then basically what we get is we get a tool that allows in-production trace of libraries in some way, um, I don't like. There are secu some security implications here, maybe that we need to discuss. But but it is not a simple change. It is ABI change because I to support a backup PLT, I need to add a bunch of DT DT dynamic tags. I think. So why can't we use the existing old, old PLT? Oh, because it might all just be changed and it might be different. And yeah, so they are, because the way is, the as I say, it's, it's a backup PLT. Normally, they are not used. Yep. You only enable them mm -hmm. when you try to do profiling or audit. Yep. So Dynamic Minker has to know when that happened and has to manually update the uh, yeah. guard entry, point to the uh, backup PLT. Yeah. So that will require, at least in my scheme, that will require new dynamic tags to mark where the uh, backup PLT is, what they mean, because each entry they have to know somehow to know, okay, the first entry point to which symbol, you have to mapping between the uh, symbols and uh, backup PLT entry so that every linker can do proper update. So this quite few some bookkeeping involved. Okay. It's so they can, I do not believe that can be done without ABI, without new uh, the uh, tech, dynamic tech. Okay. So we're not an objection. This is kind of a uh, question of an ABI. But Florian, I'll get your comment, and then we'll probably move forward on this slide. Yeah. If I if I recall correctly, the, there was an objection that uh, the, the backup PLT would take up too much space, and basically never you'd be used by almost anyone ex except like five people on the world. And well, yeah, used only by customers in production. There are people that want to do yeah, trace, but, but yeah. It's, it's a fringe use case if we are, I mean, otherwise we would have been forced to fix it already. Um. But they use the problem, yeah. so the difference is that right now customers build their own binaries and they get trace only for their own binaries. Yeah. Right? And it's um, only, yeah. Maybe it's, that's what they want. <laughs> we don't know. Anyway, uh, uh, th there's, there's the other idea that we should investigate whether we can do it with runtime code generation, like sure. uh, trample lines. Yep. We could runtime generate the PLTs, and yeah. then you've had some patches to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have a related issue related to PLT and everything, especially CET. So we defined ABI for CET more than two years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Red Hat already deployed in Rails eight, and with minor update required for because the final link, uh, the kernel interface will be require some additional uh, program header. So that's a small issue. The bigger issue is the LVM, particularly LD. Uh, Carlos, I think you remember, I think last time you sent out the email to API mailing list asking that's what, that's what we had, that's what we want to keep. Uh, do we get any response from the LRD developers on that? Um, so this is from Ryu's, Ryu, who's the LLD maintainer. 
Um, I don't know what the status of that is right now. I don't know if they've merged the patches. That no, the uh, Intel, I was a different team. We have a different yeah. team uh, at Intel working on the RBM side. Uh, they do have a patch submitted, and uh, everything works except the uh, the RVM LD developed maintainers, particular one from Google. He wanted to go a different direction. They in terms of ABI, that's what you are email res was yeah. responding to. Yeah, and I do not believe that issue has been resolved. And my question is, how how should we reach out to the RD, our main community, to resolve this issue? You're, so I mean, like, glibc implements a loader that you know implements the ABI that was defined by the hardware vendor, which was Intel at the time, and that was discussed upstream. So I, at this point, I think we just need to re-ping the issue on the ABI list and ask again for people to respond and ask for consensus. I think it, it's an entirely a problem for us on the ABI list to to re-ask those people to comment again on the document. I don't, I don't, I don't have any. You know, there's no magic bullet there to, yeah, I know. to help it, make it, people coordinate with the community that is try, of technical experts that are working together to try to find what the ABI should be, other than to ask them to contribute. And I had an impression, could be totally wrong. The RVM community like has a tendency to go their own ways to do things. And even over the objection of from the uh, general community, I think one particular thing I do not remember, they are adding something and someone said, oh, you do not need to add anything. You just need to do this way. I do not remember what, what, what that was, but they didn't pay attention or whatever. Yeah. They just went ahead to do their way for whatever reason. Yeah. So the, what in the case of this CT, what, I don't know. So we tried, so Intel has tried yeah. to uh, say that is we have, that's what we define, what I do you follow, but they are uh, attitude is we don't, we don't care, in my, my it, impression. It is, yeah. I. It's probably a bit off topic for this boff, but yeah, uh, Florian, go ahead. Um, if I recall correctly, they had similar concerns to the kernel developers, and maybe the kernel changes already addressed what they wanted to do, because the node alignment issue is basically solved with the. No, no, it's not about load and my. It's a PLT, the API issue, the PLT issue. Yeah, so it, the uh, L there was yeah. a second issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. So it, it's the uh, LLD has an issue with the design that the hardware vendor proposed. So yeah, and that they want to go back and have it changed. But I mean, at this point, we can't change it. So well, yeah. now I can't. Yeah. So no, and it, it, yeah, I think their proposal also had performance implications for for cache utilization. Yeah, that's correct. That's yeah. the uh, they are saying uh, that's unproven. That's that's the opinion. But some form. things are difficult to prove, and you have to look at them from first principles in the hardware architecture, right? There are, for, there are issues that you can only show from first principles and say, this is the way that it is, and it'll affect the architecture. Even if you can't measure it, it will have an impact at some yeah. point. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I, I'll, we want to gong that one. Uh, I just want to remind people that I am working. There is a contribution checklist V2 that's a, intended to streamline the process for new contributors. We went through a partial review a while ago. I'm going to resurrect that thread and go through it. This is just a reminder that if you want to see it, it's up on the wiki. You can look at the V2 versus the V1 contribution checklist. It's what we've been taking new contributors and having them go read. And I think we, we totally revamped it to try to minimize the amount of things that a contributor has to look at and to make it kind of streamlined as they walk through it. I want to thank several people in the room for the review of the V2. Florian, Joseph, at Hemerval, I think, commented on it. Um, thank you very much for that. And I will try to answer the last of the remaining niggling details and get us to get a shorter, more succinct V2 contribution checklist. Um, at this point, I mean, this is a, like, a speculative one, uh, was a discussion by some people that, like, um, should we mangle glibc private in some way to prevent people from using those symbols? 
Um, we did find, I found a subsequent abuse of glibc private symbol namespace by, I think it's SSSD or something, calling into NSS interfaces that were private. And uh, it's one of these cases where I was like, why are you guys doing this? And they're like, oh, because this is the best workaround for this. And I'm like, it's not a workaround if you haven't talked to us about it. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's like, with the workaround is you come to us and you say, hey, I got this problem, you know, how are we going to fix it? And I say, oh, well, the best workaround is just linked against the glibc private symbol. And uh, so, you know, I, I know I mentioned this, but it is simply kind of a reminder to us that there, we need to be open about uh, APIs for certain projects really sometimes need internal details. And so what we need to do is think about how do we define new APIs that provide some details. And I mean, the, the biggest ones here are uh, Rust wants a private symbol because it wants to look at uh, stack scope for its own tracking for its GC. Uh, the D language we just recently found was actually using uh, a private S390 symbol to get access to TLS offsets. And SSSD is using private symbols to access NSS internals because it implements uh, NSS caching. And there's some information that it has it doesn't need. But all these three use cases have something in common, people using glibc private symbols, because they need a new API. So if there's one of you that's looking for a, like a complex project that you kind of want to work on, one of them is looking at these three uses. Uh, one of them got fixed. D got fixed because it was just we had to change it to use the right public interface. But the other two are as of yet still unresolved. The TLS one for Rust really requires kind of a split out of things. So, Florian. Uh, and I actually helped the OpenJDK people to use the same mechanism as Rust for essentially the same purpose. So. Oh, you, you helped them in use a private symbol for the. The yeah, it was it was the best solution for them. I mean, that, that's okay, but like, I mean, I, it's on a non-default flag, so it, it, I think it was okay. Yeah. So uh, should we promote it to a real symbol? Yeah. Well, see, no, yeah, I, I, it was an expedient hack no, to use it, but should we promote yeah, it? it? They, they needed they do they want they need compatibility with uh, they wanted to fix something with existing glibc builds. So. Okay. Uh, but yeah. going forward. You know, like there, uh, yeah. this slide is to remind Maybe us next, that there's that there's we, scope for APIs here. Well, for this particular thing, the TLS storage thing that Rust uses and OpenJDK uses now too, um, if we still look at that next year and that we are in the same state, and maybe we should make it public. Yeah. We still need to provide it under the glibc private symbol because that is people look for that using GLVs and. Correct. So it yeah. would be a pretty. No, we would break. We don't want to break things that yeah. we know we're using them, but we definitely uh, want to encourage them away yeah, from that. Yeah, but maybe we have the new TCB allocator by then, and then it's obsolete anyway. Yeah. How much time do we have left? Okay. Um, so this is just just a brief discussion on that. Um, I had a brief note on building glibc in parts. We'd raised at one point if we wanted to build libmvec as a separate library or libm to be buildable as a separate library or the malloc implementation to be buildable as a separate library. And in many of these cases, the uh, use case that comes up are users on systems that want to upgrade only certain components in scope for, for glibc. Like they want to leave everything in place except get a new libm, or they want to leave everything in place but get a new libmvec, or they want to get the latest malloc improvements but stay on the existing glibc that they've got and they've tested on. Now this was, I mean we don't have to talk about this slide at all, we can skip this. Um, and in fact the question is, the, the, like one of the questions that kind of falls out of this is, um, do we have any consensus towards heading towards a single library that implements everything? Or a loader plus a single library? Or should the single library also have the loader? So if anyone wants to talk about that, yeah. Uh, I just want to for provide more context. So for libm, the problem is that the iFunk resolvers depend on the CPU features selection state in glibc, and that's uh, an internal interface. Mm -hmm. And and that's uh, that's basically the major problem why uh, it's hard for downstream users to do their own thing. Uh, and uh, basically patch, uh, basically build uh, glibc twice from different source tarballs and uh, add this uh, differentiation downstream. 
and uh, that's why I posted upstream patches for that, but that hasn't been, uh, I have basically given up on moving that forward due to, okay. uh, due to the community, lack of community interest, and that's also mm -hmm. not a compelling case for us to do okay. this. Joseph. I've got a tangentially related question that came up in some other discussions at Scaldron. So, right now, Decimal Floating Point is a separately maintained LibDFT project, and then there's some stuff in GCC and some stuff in LibGCC, but it's only in the static LibGCC because Jakob had these objections 10 years ago that, like, the rest of LibGCC on x86-64 was 100 kilobytes and decimal floating point stuff was 5 megabytes. So, anyway, there's a question of, given that decimal floating point has moved from a separate TRTS into an optional feature in the C standard in the next revision C2X, should we consider if decimal floating point stuff belongs as part of the GLibC project, whether or not as part of a separate shared library? Florian, do you want to do you want to talk about that? Uh, my impression is that the way forward for libdfp is, if we want to actually support it in any form, we need to integrate it into glibc. But at the same time, that doesn't that doesn't seem to be any interest in that, neither from us nor from IBM. So uh, I don't know. Ask Julio. I would, I, you know, I, I would let him answer for, so my opinion, and I, I voiced my opinion in Manchester when we had Cauldron, and I said we should merge libdfp into glibc and just, just move that way forward. And in fact, if we do that, it gets rid of the hooks in printf. We can deprecate the, the registration hooks, and then we don't need to have them. But, or do we need, still need them? Okay, I guess, all right, we'll keep the hooks. Um, so the question is, is there interest from IBM in merging libdfp into glibc? Yes. Okay. Yes. That, that actually, we have a, 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 an issue open in the, in the project in order to uh, progress uh, uh, libdfp and eventually get it merged into glibc. Um, yeah, we just need... Uh, to continue working, uh, get a list of things that we need to complete before we get libdfp merged. Okay. So it doesn't... There would certainly be a lot of things needing fairly substantial reworks for proper integration into glibc. I should incidentally note this 5 megabyte stuff for the BID stuff is certainly not necessary, as in maybe with a slight speed space trade-off, you could do the binary decimal conversions correctly with maybe 10 kilobytes of data rather than several megabytes. Okay. So, I mean, it looks like there is, that we are interested in merging libdfp. We'd just bring it in because it's part of the optional spec now. And so we would just implement it. It would simplify everything. And in fact, the compiler could also then simplify some things internally and, and we could clean things up. So it's, what I'm hearing is it's just time. Right, it's like yes, there's complete, a lot complete of things, other transitions, yes. and then yes. a we lot move of things would LibDFP. need fairly substantial reworks in order to in order to integrate it properly. Sure. Okay. And a clear list of what needs to be done. Uh, that that's important too. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, this this kind of like building glibc in parts. Um, I don't think there's anything else to say about this other than. In some cases, some parts of the project are interesting to update, but um, if we have a singular libc, as we've been moving some of the, the forwarders from libpthread to, to libc, it, it does make it easier internally to have all the pieces in one library. I know that uh, Muscle Upstream has the same, same kind of strategy, and like from an implementation perspective, it does make life a heck of a lot easier between the libraries. Like, even working on a, a DL free res, which is really for Valgrind to make sure that we can free all resources, the cross DSO DL free res never worked correctly until we fixed it like half a year ago or something. And so it's one of those issues where there are cross DSO boundaries that make it difficult to, to implement stuff. So yeah, I mean, pretty much the, the, the initialization, the early initialization that, that kind of bounces between NPTL, uh, Pthread, yeah. and LibC, we, we can get rid of all of that. And it's, it's really crafty. Uh, yeah. I mean, we should probably just move all of that into one library and be done with it. So the, the one place where I'm hesitant about merging everything is the loader. Because there is some quite a big benefit in having a defined loader interface. Agreed. 
yeah. because so if you cut the libc. line at the loader, then all of a sudden you can have alternate loaded libc's in shared private namespaces as a way to potentially load legacy libraries with shims into your into your namespace. But uh, Florian, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, for for libp thread integration, we need to provide a way to detect whether we are multi-threaded or not. That's why I worked on the single-threaded uh, flag. Yeah. And once we have that, and uh, maybe a, a re release after that has been published, we can move li libp thread into libc. Yeah. Um, even if we don't do the full cleanups at that point. And the, the, the downside is that software that doesn't use the single-threaded flag uh, will always assume that lib3, libp thread has been loaded and use the atomics and the slow paths. So th things have to be ported to the new world. But uh, Libsyn and C++ will do that very early, so it's just a rebuild yeah. for, okay. for, for the C++ shell pointer code. OK. Um, if there's no more comments on there, I think we'll go forward and say, um, we talked on and off about updating glibc build infrastructure for many years, and I think it's one of these things that feeds into new, feeds into main maintainers. Like if I want to review 100 patches a day and I need to do builds, I want the builds to be as fast as possible. So one of the things that, we, that we've run into, and I think uh, is that like, you know, we serialize some places where we don't have to, and we do it because of resource issues, or we don't have accurate dependency information. Can we just get consensus that we would really want to have accurate dependency information? Like, if you like, like raise your hand if you don't want accurate dependency information in glibc <laughs> for the build infrastructure. You don't want it? Why not? What, do we, what would we do to make, make it build faster? Uh, it will make um, the, the backputs pretty complicated. Because we can't, uh, currently, we, uh, when you, you you add dependencies to uh, on 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 a, if you add a dependency on a program, then it has to be a linker input file. And so you're just saying it, it complicates backports because, because you, you have, have to, backport to edit all the the make dependency the, pieces. No, no, no. You have to edit the make files, and that will introduce additional conflicts. But uh, yeah, if we if we have a solution to that, uh, if we don't have to, to have a solution to that if the new system is clearly superior, then yeah, obviously it's not an issue. Yeah, but you, you phrase it in a pretty um, <laughs> suggestive way, so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I just wanted, I want, uh, if we edit all the make files, we, there, should be, uh, we, there should be a clear benefit and not just something that's half-baked and yeah. gets, a, uh, gets us to maybe 95% instead of 90% there. Yeah. Um, and I don't have a good answer to this. I mean, I think, DJ, you did the experiment, right? You did li literally tore out the no parallel things and tried to run the build, and it blows up? It blows up, yeah. Okay, yeah. So there are missing dependencies, and yep. it doesn't work. Okay. So are you thinking, for example, say, of arranging it to use non-recursive make with a single make dag all, all about all the files and all the dependencies? So I would, I would like it to use a non-recursive make and be able to understand all the dependencies, sort them, and then run it most optimally. But I don't know how feasible that is. And the thing is, we need probably some kind of plan for how this would progress from where we are now to where we want to be. Why? Do you, th you think we should not use well, a single... I like a non-recursive make. It yeah. is certainly a very big change. Another, another thing that I know may have been discussed, I think Zach may have had some ideas on, say, changing how we do the system search, possibly yeah. doing some of the search separately rather than in make. Yeah, so I don't have... An, like, for this, I don't have... An, there's no implementation detail here other than... Um, I mean, if we... Switching to non-recursive make would require you still to would require you to probably have accurate dependency information for make to sort the things in the orders that they need to get built in. Today, it's kind of by their directories that you're recursing that things get done, and some things run not in parallel, and so then it just happens to work. And sometimes it actually bites you. 
and if you run things in a subdir, it doesn't work, and sometimes it blows up your whole build directory, and you have to start from, from scratch again. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for this one. But I, but I would like to see this faster under the pretense that if I want to review 100 patches a day, we're going to have to have builds go faster than they go now. Yeah. Um, what do you think about uh, generating the make files instead of writing the recipes in make directly using Python or something like that? I think that may have been one of the things Zach was thinking of, say, at least for the things involving sysstep searches, rather yeah. than having make do some extremely complicated sysstep search. Uh, there may be other ideas, you know, could you, rather than doing sysstep searches all the time, install, install some of the headers and then just look in one directory, except, of course, Right now, you've got some systems doing include next, so you've got several layers of systems directories including each other. So that particular thing would have worked with building intermediate three with chosen files. The, the way out of that that I feel would be the best approach would be to statically determine the system orders and just have a fixed list that is just there as a first step. But we would have to fix that list by each system and then keep that list fixed, and then, like, that'd be the only way out of that rat hole is to delete that code and have a fixed list if it's even possible. So, um, and so uh, the last one here is kind of uh, tests. So um, we had discussions on lists that were kind of like, we keep adding tests, and as you keep adding tests, no matter what, as a developer, it's going to take longer and longer to test things. So the question was, there's always, this comes up as uh, test grouping, right? So is there a set of tests that you run as a developer after you do some work and you want to do a build, you want to check to see if that build works, you want some quick turnaround time there. There's also the kind of thing you're going to do when, before you do a release. So when you run uh, make, you want to run all the tests before you do a release. Um, so what do we want to see in terms of test grouping, if that's something that we want? Do we want a test set of tests that run in a fixed amount of time? So you can just say, give me sanity tests, and I want this to be tested, and it should run in a fixed amount of time. Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm looking at you guys in the audience. If you're developing patches, what do you want out of this, out of the test testing? And I mean, there's, so for a long time, it, it's been panacea that we have, that we should have um, install tree testing. Is this kind of, you know, it would really quite nice, but it requires to actually run and install and keep that install updated after you make changes, and it's quite expensive. So I don't know if that's necessarily something we really want to run on make check, but make check should be have kind of some limit. So Florian, uh, for my workflow, I mean, uh, you might have seen it uh, yesterday. Um, for me, it's it's actually the most important part is to be to, to be able to to run an individual test quickly, and we have still support for that today. Okay, so for you, you say I don't care about speed. The testing can no, run every once, but I want to run one test yeah, all, I, all the time. I before before submitting a patch, I do a full build, but uh, and a full test usually, maybe even on one than more than one architecture and. Uh, but uh, that is not what uh, what uh, slows me down. Well, what's really annoying is the lack of ability to run a single test, okay. even uh, starting with a, a going from a, a, a clean tree rebuild from scratch, um, and then run a single test that takes used to take uh, maybe one hundred and uh, one minute fifty seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, a year ago, and it's now like up to three or four minutes because of the container generation. Okay. That. So, did, do we see that there's some consensus that for this use case, it's build, run a single test, edit, build, run the same single test, like that cycle? Does like does anybody else in the audience see like yeah, that's a use case that that thing should be fast? Yeah. Okay. Uh, test run does not invoke the test with all the correct parameters at all. It does. It doesn't rebuild anything. It and test run even test run. So in many cases, the make file has a bunch of uh, nvars it has to set for the test to run correctly, and test run does not do any of that. 
So it needs to be, no. No, for all the like DT needed tests that run uh, LD audit environment variables, none of those get set. Those tests all blow up if you run them in, in test, test run. Test run is just like. And, and I'll add to all that, that yeah. the, when you add containers, cross compilation and remote targets onto that, that one command line to run the test is like a page of different environment variables for each different layer. And that's what. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We, like if we're gonna, if we agree that this is a use case, then we will drive down to the fact that the single test turnaround use case is something that will, like the flip side of me reviewing 100 patches a day is you writing 100 patches a day for me to review. And if the terrorist test turnaround time takes long enough, then you can't write 100 patches a day. So Arjun, you have a question? Uh, just something I said before, I think last year, and I'll say again, to be able to see tests fail against the older version, this is something that's useful when, when you're doing regression testing. So right now you, you see a patch and it has a new test along with a fix. It's kind of hard to actually run this test against an unfixed glibc and see that the test fails when the fix isn't there. Yeah. That's, that's, that's useful to see, to see that a test failed and then passed. Yeah. So the A-B testing is, is interesting whether or not, like, so you're saying, like, if the test was separatable from the infrastructure and then run, the, the difficulty I see there is that we do a lot to provide infrastructure for testing, both in libsupport, the container, or the infrastructure the test has access to. The test may be a test special, which has access to internal headers to be able to touch things that are internal. So decoupling the tests into a separate like libc tests repo has been discussed but it's uh, i mean there's a lot of tight coupling between the tests and glibc yeah um i have an out of tree lib support thing that actually i i think you can still build on glibc 217 so it goes way back and most of the current tests can actually build using it. It's not kind of kind of, uh, kind of painful to use if a if you have a complex test mm -hmm. uh, and you need to set up environment variables and stuff like that. But because that's not going to be copied over if you copy just the test file, yeah. but uh, it can show pretty quickly if the t uh, test actually isolates the bug okay. and you don't run into glibc version problems because you build against the system glibc at that point. Yeah. But if you needed new symbols, you wouldn't be able to test that way. Yeah, but you can't, uh, if, you, if you're testing your symbols, then you, you can't test it for regression, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. If, so if I had to say the criteria for me today would be, does, it, does that kind of change let me create 100 patches a day or review 100 patches a day, right? So if it does, then we'd go that way. But I think if I had to tackle a problem today, it would be this problem of a single test cycle would let you really fast turn around one, one bug fix for a single regression test that you'd written that you want to have tested. Um, I think, um, I want to make sure, yeah, that was it. Uh, so uh, modernized glibc process. Uh, this discussion kind of got started in Jeff's talk, and it is, what are we doing today to make a reviewer's job easier? How can I review 100 patches a day? I want to review 100 patches a day. And I say, Carlos, you can't review 100 patches a day because it would literally just take you too long to go through these patches and reviews and make sure that things work. How do we get to that point? Like the, the vision of having a reviewer capable of reviewing 100 patches a day. And so I'm not asking for consensus here today, but um, Jeff brought up a lot of issues, which are, you know, uh, what happens if we put glibc on GitLab? Is that something we want because of the infrastructure, the API, the hooks that might allow me to review 100 patches a day? Would it help? And what are the requirements? And I think email integration has been discussed, and so there are some things that we can maybe do research on to find out if we can have plugins to help us change those things. But I'm interested in hearing people's comments. Um, and they are, I don't want this to be contentious, but you know the the goal in my mind is I want to review more patches. So Florian, do you have a comment? Yeah. Well, I have some experience with GitLab. I don't find it very convenient to use 
for the for these purposes. But it's my personal experience with GitLab. I don't mind any. Well, actually, Precomitia is very useful uh, mm -hmm. for reviewing because you don't want to review something that doesn't pass the tests. For example, uh, you're actually not interested if it if there are if it introduces regressions then. Why would you want to spend your time on something like this? But the GitLab instance, it's like, I don't find it very convenient to use. OK. Uh, my comment is more on the same uh, idea, but with a different project. Um, actually, I don't have enough interaction with GitLab, but I would recommend to be very careful, because with libdfp and other libraries that uh, we uh, I reveal patches. The reveal system is really terrible. Uh, and yeah, th there are better implementations, and uh, it's important to be very careful with. That. Sure. And and just to be clear, I like this is just like a pot, like me discussing off the top of my head. Like yeah. like how am I going? Oh, brainstorm. How am I going to get to review 100 patches a day? Whether it's like email to patchwork. Patchwork kicks off a, a build bot, try bot, CI job that then sends an email to the list. And the list, now when I go to review the patch, there's a follow-up by the bot that says, I ran CI on eight of these images, and they all came across green. And I'm like, well, I'm going to review that patch right now because it's green while it's hot today, right? So from the metric that I'm applying is how can I scale myself as a reviewer, make my job easier to accept community patches. So, Sidesh. Yeah, so I, I was going to say pretty much the same thing, which is let's not get stuck on GitLab as, as the tool that we're going to use. Uh, I guess the question is more like do we want to uh, switch to a tool? It could be Patchwork plus Tribot, it could be GitLab, it could be Fabricator, it could I, be anything else. I think else. we do want to keep experimenting. I think we as a community will fail if we stop experimenting with things to make our lives better. Right. I don't mean fail in the broad sense. I mean, like, we will always be able to build software and do things, but we won't, I won't succeed at my vision, which is to review 100 patches a day. The day I review 100 patches a day would be awesome. That day would rock. Right. And the, They'd be a long day. Sure, whatever. There's a lot of coffee in the world, so like. So, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, right now there may there may not be a single tool that serves our purpose, but then uh, in a way we kind of represent this whole class of projects. It's not just GLPC. Uh, mm -hmm. We do a bunch of things that uh, we 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 kind of set uh, a. a proof of concept, so to speak, for GCC, GDB, and so on. And we can actually help improve those tools. So if, if, if HTML emails are a problem, for example, we can actually try and work with, say, GitLab or Fabricator and try to get that fixed. And that makes it easier for GCC in the future yeah. to pick up the same thing. So whatever tool it is, that's, that's probably a secondary thing for now. What is more important is this general consensus that we want to do this. Yeah. And then what are the challenges to that? So one challenge, obviously, is changelog. And yes, get it out because of the merge conflicts. Right. It doesn't let, like, merge conflicts, even with the driver, still messes up my patch review workflow because if I try to commit something and it's wrong merge, right. done. And what, what is the other challenge? I, I don't think there's anything else that No, really so I think the next step is, well... Florian has an idea for what's the challenge that prevents me from reviewing 100 patches a day. So the, the question is uh, if we need uh, exemptions for the GNU maintainers. What does that mean? Yeah, because the GNU maintainers don't have to follow process today. So if we implement something that prevents them from doing that in the future, what does that mean for us? We mean like, what's well, so like, if you so yeah. If I so like I am I am one of the GNU maintainers. I'm responsible for the project to the FSF and GNU. In theory, I like currently as written in the GNU maintainers guide, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to listen to anybody. Yeah, right? correct. And but, you have but, you, you have you have uh, some of your colleagues don't actually follow procedure that we have established. And yeah. Sure. All you have is my word, and whether or not you trust me. Really, but like no, 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 I no, have the to the build that is, trust with the, the community. Is, yeah. No, the problem is if uh, if we 
if there's an expectation that uh, the the new system, if you have if we have a CI in, in place, if mm. there will be an escape hatch for the chosen few, just to bypass that because they are GNU maintainers. I think there should be no escape hatch for anybody, and that the GNU maintainers should follow the same process. But I can work to ratify that at the GNU level if we want to to discuss that as a what that means for the maintainers or how to attain consensus between the maintainers. So we did discuss that some kind of like consensus vote among the existing maintainers because there has to be a way to break maintainer deadlock, right? So the so we've had this issue where like if we have project we're over time, but there is a, there is an issue of governance. And the issue of governance is what happens when the community can't agree to something. And how does that decision get taken to the stewards? And how, do the, how are the stewards held accountable and whether or not they can make a decision as well? Uh, I have a quick note. Yeah. So we use the GitLab uh, for some of our projects. Uh, we have, I think we have found they are at least a patch review system. It's much better than email. It's much, much better than email. And, uh, but on the other hand, they, although the GitLab provides all the uh, facilities like CI issue tracking review, the uh, issue tracking part is not very, uh, say, convenient. It's adequate, but it's not very convenient. So that's my personal experience on the GitLab. It's a very mm. good interface for review. Yeah. Let, let me put it this way. Yeah, I, I like Bugzilla. I have no, no reason to move away from Bugzilla for tracking. And the integrated sourceware Bugzilla tracker for all the projects together is convenient for us. So I think incremental process changes really is like, how do I get to 100 reviews a day? And from my perspective, at the very least, conceptually, I want pre-commit CI and build bots to be clean. So those are two things that I can look at. Pre-commit CI, try bots, and build bots so that after someone commits a patch, I can see if things went red. And if I was the reviewer, which is, did I put a reviewed byline on that patch, then the, then the failing build bot can say, by the way, this, this commit failed. The reviewers were these people. So the build bot is going to go back and say, your patch broke it. You reviewed it. The two of you need to work out what happened with that, with that review, in my opinion. So. Um, we are out of time. We're two minutes, two minutes long. Um, do we have one more, one more question in the back? Not really a question. It's an unrelated, unrelated I, I think. I actually hope to, 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 for some time to, for general discussion at this BOF. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, I was at uh, Linux Plumbers earlier this week giving a talk about uh, Cisco wrappers in JLFC. It was very positively received. However, uh, I've had pri pri prizes about our contribution process. However, the issue is uh, there is no general no notion about that among uh, Linux kernel people. So we, I suppose it's our job to make them aware that we are much easier to, to work with these days than it used to be before. So, so essentially there's a request to get the word out that we sort of friendly community consensus driven these days and, and, and uh, that, that has to be spread. I, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate that you went to LPC. Yes, and they're still the, 10 the years old. Yeah. Uh, yes, they still have 10 years old. Uh, ideas about GNU-LIPC project. Yeah, I think like the way to solve that is continue to go to LPC, continue to present, continue to go to the tools microconf and be like, hey, I'm a GLIPC developer. It's fine. Here's how the process works. We're willing to listen to your patches and um, continue that discussion. So I think it has worked successfully and I think LPC as an integration point for us is a good place and we should keep going. And uh, Jose Marchesi who's not, not here right now, but um, the discussions we had before LPC to kind of come together as a community and say, well, who's going to go, who's going to yeah. present, that kind of organic thing is very good for yeah. us to yeah. go. So, so the yeah. issue essentially is we need more interaction yeah. between the two communities. Yeah. We are, we are really, we're five minutes over, we're out of time, but thank you very much, everybody.